คำถามจากชาวต่างชาติครับ uh, no no leave no leave earth if I attach Buddha to the breath I get irritated if the uh, breath disappears and with it the mantra if I recite Buddha independently the tempo change how to deal with that you can just choose either one you don't have to tie your mantra with your breath You can either use the breath alone without the mantra, or you can use the mantra without the breath. It's sufficient enough to make your mind become calm and peaceful. So you don't need to use both of them unless you find it beneficial and you you want to use both of them. That's okay also. A uh, second question. Uh, in sitting meditation, I tend to slowly bend forward without realizing it. But readjusting myself would disturb the meditation. Can t a n a j a n please give advice? When you start meditating, before you meditate, you should sit in the proper position. Once you have sit properly, when you start meditating, then you just ignore the position of the body. Should it shift forward or backward, to the left or to the right? Just don't don't pay attention to it. It's not important. The important is to have mindfulness with your meditation, and your mind can enter into peace and calm regardless of the position of the body. But if you keep paying attention to your body, then you are not meditating, so you would never achieve the result for meditation. So ignore everything besides the body. There might be other distraction. You might feel itchy here and there. You might feel pain here and there, or you might see something in your meditation. Just ignore all of them. Don't don't pay any attention to anything. Only focus on your meditation object. If you want to achieve the result from your meditation, which is calm, peaceful, and happy. Um, t h a n a Chan. Um, This is my third retreat at uh, at the place here, Chan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my my, I I have uh, stopped work for about uh, 150 days, and out of the 150 days, 50 days I've used to uh, stay here and and practice. And so far, um, I find that progress uh, is uh, slowly. Uh, I know that is uh, because a part time practice is very difficult. Um, you have to go back and also adjust yourself and all that. So um, I uh, would like to. Um, I asked Ajahn before um, some advice, and I've been adjusting um, to my practice, and I lower my expectations and remind myself to uh, to to uh, continuously develop sati and also uh, wisdom and listening to the Dharma talk. Um, can Ajahn further give advice on 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 my uh, spiritual path? Uh, I know it's it's uh, it's a long journey, but uh, I'm uh, very confident, Chan. What you need to do is do more. That's all. You're doing the right thing, but you're not doing it enough. So you have to give more time to your practice. If you can do it continuously, it will be like taking a non-stop flight. See, from from here to America, if you non-stop, you only take twenty hours. But you keep stopping every three hours. You stop. It might take you forty hours before you get there. So you have to stay in the retreat and don't go. Don't go out. Keep staying there until you finish your work. Yeah. Thank you, John. I have another question uh, in my uh, discussion with some uh, uh, Thai people here. I uh, I heard one phrase or one proverb that uh, they use. Uh, maybe Achan can explain this because I find it very uh, interest. Uh, I cannot understand very well. This is said that, p e p e n pra, chana p e n man. So maybe just explain uh, the meaning and also the purpose of this sentence. I see. p e p e n pra means if you lose, you become a monk. Uh, <laughs> if you win, you 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 become the devil. <laughs> This is concerning your argument or disagreement with other people. Don't win because by winning you are becoming a devil. The devil. 
if you lose, it means you become an angel. Pra means an angel or a noble person. Yeah. That means you, you don't want to, to beat other people to win. You know. It's better to lose because by losing you make other people happy because you make them win. And they, don't, they, they won't get mad at you, see. And they will treat you good you know, if you let them win. But if you make them lose, then they will hate you. So it's better just to lose when you have an argument or disagreement with people. Okay, just say, give up. Okay, okay, whatever you say, okay. Yeah, I'm wrong, okay, you're right. Yeah, just say that. This is pap and pra. Lose. By losing, you become a noble person. Pra means monks or a noble person. If you win, it means you are the devil. You want to, you know, beat others to submission. You want them to accept your point of view. And you try in various ways to, to make them, you know, lose and you win. The loser will, will hate the winner, right? So this is the way to deal with people. The Buddha teaches to pap and pra, chana and man. When you deal with other people, let them win, make them happy, yeah. and then they won't come and bother you. See, if you make them unhappy, they're gonna keep come back, coming back at you. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. I can calm myself effectively just by letting go until I feel pity and the body disappears. But this way I get no mindfulness, which can be even dangerous. Is that true? If you can let go, it means you have mindfulness. In order to be able to let go, you have to have strong mindfulness to stop your attachment. So I don't think there's anything dangerous about being able to let go. Question, second question, what are the dangers of losing mindfulness when the mind goes berserk in the meditation? I heard about panic attacks, but is there more? Is this motivates me to be mindfulness? Well, mindfulness can control your, your, your mind reaction to whatever it comes across. Sometimes the mind may come across something very violent, very strong. It might make the mind uh, react violently or strongly. But if you have mindfulness, you can stop it. If you don't, you can, you can use the mantra to raise your mindfulness, to bring your mindfulness up to speed in order to be able to control and keep your mind calm. So mindfulness is very important in controlling the mind. Without mindfulness, the mind can go crazy. How can there be rebirth of the sitta if it lies in the deathless realm? Even if you attain nirvana, your sitta does not die, it just stays still. I suppose then that rebirth is just a word should be understood as just a transfer by the citta from one arm to the other. Is that right? Well, the, the citta remains in the spiritual realm. When it finds a body, it sends uh, a spiritual signal to attach to the body, to the five senses. It sends the spiritual connector, let's put it that way, to attach to the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body in order to receive the sight, sound, smell, and taste, and tactile objects that come into contact through the five senses. This is how the, the mind connects with the body, how the mind has rebirth through the new body. The mind itself remains in place it doesn't move, it, it just only changes its uh, composition in the mind. Sometimes the mind has more happiness than more 
sadness. Sometimes the mind has more sadness than happiness. But the mind just remains in the same place. When the mind has more happiness, we say the mind has gone to heaven. When the mind has more, ha more sadness, more misery, we say the mind has gone to hell. This is just a, a, a matter of figure of speech. In reality, the mind doesn't go anywhere because the mind doesn't have any size, shape, or form to travel with. It only changes its condition within itself. From Indonesia, you got any question? Ajahn, I want to ask. Can you speak closer? Uh, I want to ask to Ajahn, is there any relation uh, between uh, someone's nature or a character with their level of samadhi? No, no. The samadhi has nothing to do with uh, your, what you call your character. Mm. Yes. Samadhi is calming your mind, stop your mind from, uh, from being active. Any, any people with any character can practice Samadhi. Mm -hmm. I think you mean that different people might have different uh, obstacles in their practice. The Buddha divided people into four distinct characters, people who is uh, doubtful uh, people or who people who is who has faith you know, faithful they can use one kind of meditation object you know. people who is easily to anger they have a different kind of meditation object to use so but we usually have all these different uh, character within us. Sometimes we are not faithful, sometimes we get angry. So we have to change our meditation object accordingly. If we are doubtful of the Buddha, if we are not faithful, then we have to seek the Buddha's advice or his teaching, study his life, then you can become uh, not doubtful of his, of the Buddha. But if you're already faithful, you'll find using Bhutto and an appropriate object of your meditation. And if you're angry, then you should use Metta to, as your object of meditation. You should say, forgive, forgive the people who makes you angry. Yeah. If you can forgive, then your mind can become calm. Mm. If you are not having any issue with anyone, then maybe using your breath is an is appropriate one, mm. by watching your breath in and out. So it depends on whether what kind of uh, issue you have with your mind at the moment. If sometimes you have sexual desire, then you have to use a supa, you have to use the repulsive nature of the body as your meditation subject. So we can actually use different objects at times according to our need. Right, they're like medicines. Mm -hmm. But once they have no issue, then you usually use the, the common one, which is a mantra as putto, putto, or use the breath, watching your breath. But if you have some issues like anger or sexual desire, then you need to use some other meditation subject okay. object to to calm your mind. Okay, if let's say we already try to focus with Buddha and Anapanasati, and then um, we we already feel calm and peace. Do we need to just continue with Buddha or analyzing? You the you shouldn't do any any analyzing when you practice samadhi. Mm -hmm. The goal of samadhi is to stop your thought, stop thinking. If you're still thinking, then you should continue on with your mantra or watching your breath. Mm -hmm. You only stop when the mind becomes completely still, not thinking. 
and you feel a sense of relief, happiness. If you haven't got there yet, then you, if you can still recite Bhutto, if you can still watch your breath, you should concentrate more, continue to concentrate, because you need to concentrate more to get in deeper. There are many levels of calm. You want to go to the deepest level by continuing on with your mantra or with your watching your breath. Okay, so as we get calmer, then we we even don't think that we are reciting Buddha in the meditation. What do you mean? You don't think? Um, meaning uh, at the first of meditation, we... Would you use mantra? Yeah. You I, keep using mantra until you, your mind completely becomes still. Mm. If it's still not still, you have to use mantra. If you still can think, then you can. You still have to use mantra okay. until you don't think. When you, when until you stop thinking, then you can stop using your mantra. Mm. This will come automatically because once you stop thinking, your mantra auto stop. Mm. Because your mantra is also thinking, mm. and if you can still recite mantra, you should keep on reciting. Don't stop. When it stop, when it becomes still, it's usually like falling off a cliff, and then your mind becomes still. Then you know this is, this is samadhi. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, if you don't feel any difference, you don't feel any change in your mind, then it means you haven't yet come to samadhi, come to completely calm. Yeah. So keep on reciting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay and ignore everything that comes up. Anything that you see or hear, don't pay any attention. Just keep reciting the mantra. Okay. Okay, Okay. so if the mind is, sorry, so if the mind is already still, we just continue as well as in If you can recite mantra, keep reciting, because you haven't yet reached the, the full still. You only reach part of the way. If you stop, then you won't get anywhere further. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Could no life on earth? Question number one. Once I had to live a few days with a big aggressive dog. When I was mindful, he ignored me while he molested others. Do monks meditate with dangerous animals? It helped my mindfulness. Yes, we live in the forest. This is part of the reason because we know there are wild animals around, and they, you might come across them any time. So you have to be very careful, very mindful. So when you come across them, you can become still and not react to them. If you, if you remain still, they would not attack you. They, would not, you know, they don't feel that you threaten them. But if you, if you keep moving, they might think you're going to attack them. So they have to protect themselves. So it's a good way of de- developing mindfulness. That's the reason why monks live in the forest, to help them to develop mindfulness. And the second question, when I let go, I get into deeper states than with Bhutto. Should I practice Bhutto more? Can I combine these methods? You can use either method as far as the result is you, you should just look at the result, which method gives you the result, then you use that method. Could no life on earth? How can I lose my fear of death? I could feel it when I saw a disc shape nimitta in my meditation. Should I just let it go? Well, you should calm your mind. Once your mind becomes calm, then your mind has no reaction to death or life or whatsoever, whatever. This is the first way of uh, getting rid of your fear of death. But it's not uh, permanent. Once your mind become not calm and start to think, it can become fearful of death again. The next step is to teach your mind that your body is not you. You are the mind who tells the body what to do. You are the boss 
the mind is the, the the body is the servant. You are the master. The master doesn't die with the body. If you can tell, teach your mind this way, then when when the body dies, you will know that it's not you who dies. It is the servant who dies. When I tried metta the first time, I went into the deep state. When I lost control and just went on and on, when I came out, I felt calm and re-energized for days. Was that jhana? Yes, that's the result of jhana. When you enter in jhana, your mind becomes calm and peaceful. And if you remain in, in it for a long time, when you come out, it will it will continue to be calm and peaceful for a while. The, um, there's a couple, they're British and American, and they have two children, uh, two years old, a little boy, and another little boy is 11 months old. And they both work, so they have a babysitter for the children. This just happened on the 18th or 19th of November, the little boy drowned in the bathtub. So the babysitter took the blanket, wrapped him up, and I think he already died because at the hospital, um, it was said it took the doctors maybe 18 minutes to revive him. And then they put him like in a freezer or refrigerator because the one doctor, I guess she's very good with, you know, children drowning or whatever. Yeah. And the baby moved its foot. Actually, I have the picture on Facebook. I can, but it's okay. You don't have. Um, you know what I don't understand is, you know, there's still a young couple that can have more children. Why did the doctors, you know, try to revive him? You know, because now they say, you know, he's got brain damage, definitely. Mm -hmm. and they don't know if it's uh, how severe it is. Mm -hmm. And then they said, also, he may be in a wheelchair the, all his life, so why is he going to... I don't know why is he going to stay, you know, but I don't know what the parents have decided. Actually, my friend, she's giving me the what, what's going on about this, and now they have a Facebook page, uh, for do donations, like they come in from England over there. Yes. But not in Thai yet. Mm -hmm. What I want to, my question is, I think, you know, you should let the child go. I know it's not my decision, but if it would happen to me, I think I would let the child go. Is that, would that be a sin if they let it go? Well, the problem, you should see whether you can help or not. If you, could, if you could still help, then you should help. Because yeah. if you not help, then it means you don't have a heart. Yeah, but Tanajan, if the baby is going to be uh, in a wheelchair for the all life, I think his birthday is in within next week or the next 10 days. If he's not in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. he will, he's got brain damage definitely, but the doctors don't know how much. Well, this is something we cannot or should not interfere. That's okay. the karma of each individual. Yes, I understand that. We can only help people. Uh huh. We uh, can make the donations, but. Give people compassion and uh -huh. love. If we can do anything to make it better, we do it. But if we don't do it, then we could be blamed for neglecting. Yeah, I understand that. Like a doctor, the doctor's duty is to... Save life. Save life. But and, if you're going to uh, save a life, and the life is going to be like this, I don't know. You know, sometimes yeah. I think medical, you know, know, it's gone very, very, very far in this day and age. And some people, you know, they make them stay, and they're living like a vegetable. Right, but this is something you we assume now, see. We actually don't know what the future will be anyway. Uh-huh. Maybe things can change and the, the child might revive and grow up naturally and, and be strong. Would be possible? Anything is possible. <laughs> See, you, that's why we call the future. Uh -huh. Because the future is never certain. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you thought could not happen, actually happen in the future. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what we think of the future might not be the future we think mm -hmm. of. 
So we just let things be, do the best we can. And just help with donations, right? Donations, uh-huh. or you, with, the, with the child, do whatever you can to... I, I don't know them personally, uh-huh. but a, a good friend of mine uh, knows another friend who taught at the same school as both of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, in life there's always the good side and the bad side. We, sometimes we forget the good side, and we only look at the bad side. Of things, you know, if you know, if you know how to look at the good side of things, there is good thing that could be for the the parents. You know, if they know how to look at the the good side that they can benefit from. I think the mother is uh, quite okay, but the father, yeah. mm, I'm not sure. Because this can be a, a lesson, a, a teaching to the, whoever is involved. If if you look at life and say, you know, this is the way life is, you cannot expect it to be always rosy and beautiful. Mm-hmm. See, this is another side of life. If you if you somehow can see it, you you can really benefit from the 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 incident, the bad incident. Mm-hmm. You can use it as a, a lesson to teach yourself to not to expect all the beautiful thing in this world. Then you won't be disappointed, or you you won't be sad when you have to come across things that is not so beautiful. That is the karma of parents. It is the karma of It's everybody's karma. If you if you are born and if you are come involved with anybody or anything, yeah, it's your karma. Thank you. The best way to deal with karma is to. To take things as they are, take things as they come, the Buddha say. Everything is like a natural force that we cannot always control or manage. Sometimes we just have to flow along with the, the natural force, flow along with the whatever is happening. Then we won't be sad or unhappy. Okay? All right. um, we have a question from No Life on Earth. Recently my father died and I try to be mindful of the feeling of grief. When I see how it feels in the body, it loses its meaning. How can I use this for more, for my, for more practice? Well, when you have mindfulness, then you, you, you don't get involved with the grief that you feel, see. But when you don't have mindfulness, you, you become part of the grief itself. So mindfulness is, is the thing that will separate you from things that comes involved with you. So try to develop more mindfulness and try just to be aware of things that come and go. But you don't have to be immersed with those things that come and go. Because if you do, if they are good, when they leave you, you feel sad. If they are bad, when you see them, you meet them, you, you, don't, you feel bad. But if you're not immersed in anything, then they just come and go. This is the, the result that you can get from meditating, mindfulness meditation. Because mindfulness meditation will bring your mind to a state, to a state where you just become neutral. You don't have any emotional <coughs> involvement with anything that you come in, in touch with. No life on earth. Second question. I reach a point where I can calm myself till raptures arises in a busy mall. Could it be that I have experience from an earlier life? Possibly, but the real, the real reason is you have strong mindfulness. If you have strong mindfulness, then you can calm your mind anywhere, anytime that you want. Um. Uh, first, I want to thank you for this opportunity of staying at this temple. It's the first uh, first time here. Uh, so the question is about uh, anatta, uh, non, non self. Um, if is, is there something in particular that we can focus on in meditation in order to no- notice this uh, characteristic? This you don't have to use meditation. You, when you are not meditating, you can look at everything around you. They are all anatta, everything. They are all natural phenomena. They are not. They are not no self. No, no self in anything. 
including your body. There is no self in your body. The self is created by your mind. The concept of self, the mind created and placed upon the body by claiming the body to be yourself. You are the mind who create this concept through your delusion, through your lack of understanding of the truth of the nature of the body and everything else. That everything else doesn't belong to you. Everything belongs to nature. They come from nature and they'll go back to nature sooner or later. Like your body comes from the four elements. Eventually it will return to the four elements. This is the way to contemplate on anatta. But, um, but also the mind, or I mean... Uh, no, no, don't worry about the mind. The mind is delusional. You want to teach the mind the knowledge. That everything that the mind thinks is, is a self or a human or anything is just a concept. It's not the truth. The truth is everything comes from the four elements. And they are impermanent. They form and then they disappear. Yeah. They come, combine, and then eventually they dissolve. They always return back to the original. The water will go back to join the water. The earth will go back to join the earth. The fire will go back to join the fire. The wind will go back and join the wind. Then there will be no longer a body for you to cling on to to claim to be yourself. So this is what you want to teach your mind, to let go of everything, not to cling to anything, not to claim anything to be you or yourself or belonging to you, because they are all false, they are not truth. And they can cause you sadness and stress and suffering. The in everyday life, it's easy to forget this. Like to get That's lost why you have to live in a temple. Yeah, you have to get yourself away from the conceptualized world. The world that you live in is just a conceptualized world. It's not the true world. So you have to come out and live with nature, alone, and then re-educate your mind that everything is really part of nature. There's nothing as human, animal or the concept that we create. They're just concept. They're not truth. And then we, we become attached to the concept, not the truth. When the truth disappears, we feel sad because we still cling to the concept of a self, of a body belonging to someone, somebody. So you have to come up and live alone to re-educate your mind. It's like going to the university. This is the Buddhism, Buddhist university. It's to live in the forest alone and then re-educate the mind, to, let, to teach the mind that everything is natural phenomena. No human, no animals, nothing. Everything is just a concept. Country, race, anything like this, they are concepts. <clears throat> They're not the truth, and they all fall apart eventually, sooner or later. Okay? In order to be able to, con to contemplate this truth, you need to have a calm mind first. That's why you have to use mindfulness meditation to calm your mind. Once your mind becomes calm, your mind will become neutral. It will be free from all the conceptualized thoughts then you can then teach your mind the truth. You'll see the, the truth in a different light. You'll see everything in a different angle, from a conceptualized angle to the, real, to the reality angle. You need to have a calm mind to do this. Right now, if your mind is not calm, your mind is being uh, coated with your conceptualized uh, ideas. They are not the truth, but you think they are the truth. You think you are, therefore you are, right? Yeah. I think I am, therefore I am. 
That's all. It's just a concept that we conceptualize every day with everything that we come into contact with. So you want to re-educate your mind. Like every time you see your body, you, you will say, this is not my body. This is the body that made up of the four elements. Then one day it will kind of dissolve and return back to the four elements. This is something you need to educate your mind all the time until it becomes part of your nature to think in a different light, in a different angle, from a different angle. All right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? No, it's okay. It's plenty of time. Uh, I have one question more um, about the rebirth, because I come from a culture that there is no teaching of, of rebirth, That's and right. it's uh, difficult to uh, understand come in terms with it. And I wanted to ask you if there is like a way to uh, know from experience this truth, like to actually see for myself. You have to meditate if you can. Uh, meditate until your mind becomes completely calm. You'll, you'll see another side of yourself that you haven't seen before. That's the spiritual side of you. Then you will come to see that your life is composed of two parts, just not one part. The part that you can see is called the physical part. The part that you cannot see is the spiritual part. This will become evident when you meditate and calm your mind. When your mind becomes calm, the spiritual part becomes detached from the physical part. Then you can understand who is the one who's going to go take rebirth. Not the physical part, but the spiritual part. Because the spiritual part doesn't die with the physical part. It continues on. It goes on and takes up a new body just like you did with this new body of yours that you you used to have many different bodies before, but they all have to decompose, right? Because they don't last. So when you lose your physical part, you go look for a new physical part. You look, go look for a new partner. Your body is your physical partner. You are the spiritual part. The spiritual is the mind who thinks and feels. When, it, when, it, when it, it is part of the body, we call it the mind. But when it's separated from the body, then we call it the spirit. That's all. Every religion has this concept of a spirit, but they don't have a complete concept. They only know that there's a spirit and there's a body. And that after the body, the spirit continues on. But they don't know how to manage the spirit how to make them become beneficial to the spirit itself. Only Buddhism, only the Buddha who had discovered that in order to, to benefit the spirit, you have to stop the spirit from taking rebirth. Because with every rebirth comes all forms of anxiety and suffering and stress and so forth because you will have to uh, manage things that you cannot control, such as your body and everything else around you. But if you have no rebirth, then you won't have to manage or control anything. And you can still exist without having a body. So Nibbana is like the spirit without, uh, That's right. like alone. Right. Without alone. any desire, any cravings. The three cravings that, uh, that that drags you to rebirth is the three cravings, sensual, craving for sensual pleasure, craving for beings, and craving for non-being. This you can get rid of by using the practice of morality, meditation, and wisdom. Okay? okay. Thank you very much. You can, you can take my books in English with you if you like. Yes, I took one. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Come time to Kunchiran. Why we don't get Sotapanna's persons from birth? Because it says Sotapanna can be born for several lives. Therefore, why can't we see any Sotapanna from birth? If you were Sotapanna in previous life, 
and you are born, you will still be a sotapanna. But sometimes people, other people may not know who you are, and maybe even yourself, you don't know that you are sotapanna, because the sotapanna is the description, it's the name. You might be a sotapanna without knowing that you are sotapanna, but you know that you are not, you are not, you are not hurt by whatever happened to, to your body. If you are not hurt by aging, sickness, or death, then you are sotapanna. But sometimes you don't know this until you read the book. If you read the text and say, "Oh, I am sotapanna," because I'm not, you know, I'm not affected by aging, sickness, or death. But before that, I didn't know. But I'm still a sotapanna, whether I know or not. Sotapanna is just a name, a description of the state of mind. That's all. So people can be sotapanna and not knowing what a sotapanna is until he or she reads the text and then read the description, then finds out that it fits his or her description. Then he or she can, uh, what you call, can, can summarize, can conclude that he or she is a sotapanna.